Book Group with Mary Through the Mists by Robert James Lees Chapter 12 This is Session 3 24th of October 2012 Wondai, Queensland, Australia uh, G'day everyone we are still on chapter 12 because it's a beauty. <laughs> Did everyone get notification of that during the week? So you knew that and so there was a, some extra homework to look at. Yeah, cool. All right, well, I'm looking forward to biting that off with all of you. Um, but before that, I just need to talk some business and logistics. And this is probably Unless you have more to add, babe, do you have more to add? No? Nope. That's probably the perfect way to lead into the first part of our discussion, which is about sympathy. Um, because I felt last week that, look, this is, a, this is a magic moment in the history of book group, I'm telling you, that we are doing th session three on a chapter that's four pages long. <laughs> But I feel it's because there's all this stuff coming to the fore for me and, and, and then for you guys <laughs> around what is this group about, what are we really doing here, are we in addiction, how's it all, you know, let's get really real is my feeling. And because of that, I'm also seeing how I am up here a lot more. I'm enjoying it more but then I, then I walk away and I go, oh. I know what I just did then. I know what the interaction was. I'm, this is where I'm not practicing love. I'm still feeling like I have to be a certain way for you guys or do a certain thing or meet a certain addiction in order for things to flow smoothly. So this is why we're up to session three <laughs> because I'm gonna get it right <laughs> in terms of love. It, and my, my problem last week is that I tried to get it right in terms of teaching and I missed a lot of the issues of love because, because when, we're, when we're learning this stuff or when we're confronting this stuff, when we're you know, really going, what does this really mean? Often the answer doesn't come that quickly because our soul is still resisting it, our soul's still closed to it. And then what happens is often we go, I want to get it. Mary, does it mean this? Mary, are you saying this? Mary, should, so if this happens, does that happen? So how does this... And, and in the end, because I'm like, man, I can feel I don't get it. How can I help them get it? I end up like working really hard and saying, look, let's just say sympathy and rapport are separate. And so that way we will just be able to understand this and understand that. And I feel a few light bulbs go on and I go, oh, okay, right, we're getting somewhere. And then I walk out the room and I go, I missed it. <laughs> I missed it because I should have just said, look, guys, I know this is new and big and be you're not getting it straight away in your soul and that just means that there's an emotional resistance to this. So why don't you go home and pray about it so you can open up to it? Because in the end, we want to understand things in our soul, not in our head. And I end up, you know, trying to work really hard so that we get in our head and we can all just avoid that huge feeling of uncertainty, which is something that we have to go through if we're going to be humble. <laughs> Does that make sense? That's what happened last week. <laughs> so this week, there's a few more things I need to say about sympathy. <laughs> who, um, who answered the, the question, the homework question around sympathy? How can sympathetic attraction be loving? Yeah? Okay, let's start at the back with Jason. And we'll come, we're, if the mic can go to Jen on this, oh, you still got it, yeah. I just felt that with sympathy, um, it's a law of attraction event, and if we're open to law of attraction events, um, and then we, and, and also have a desire to progress in love, yep. then we can see sympathy, attraction as a, a, a perfect opportunity. Um, and it was designed by God, so it's obviously loving. Yes. It's just that we're not awake to it. <laughs> yeah. So, Ab so that's how it's loving. Absolutely. So we're attracting something. We know it's all governed by love, as we said last week. Um, so obviously there's an opportunity inherent in this attraction. I can choose to respond lovingly and grow. 
Last week we got really bogged down in talking about how when we don't choose to respond lovingly, we get into codependence, blur, blur, and it, and and Graham kept saying to me, but Mary, sympathetic attraction, there must be a way that it's loving. And I'm like, well, we're just talking about codependence here, Graham, and and he was there, he was there, my little messenger of truth, saying, it's all loving <laughs> because we have the opportunity to respond. So. That's exactly right, Jason. And I just really wanted to stress that with you guys because I didn't want to move on in this book where, and where we're all going, oh, sympathetic attraction, it's a nightmare because it's actually perfect and wonderful. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And also there was this idea um, last week that we talked about codependence. So this is when, say I'm angry and someone else is afraid, we're happy to come together. And then there's also the case where... We, and in that case, we have the same belief, a like belief. That is, I should pander to anger. And both of us believe that we should pander to anger. The frightened person does and the angry person does. That's the like attracting like. So do you guys get that? The other situation is where we both think it's okay to be angry with men. Like attracts like. That same belief brings us together. So that's where we can't say we have exactly the same emotional or soul condition, but we do have a common belief, and this is the like attracting like. This is the sympathy. So is that cool with everyone? Yeah, awesome. Jen, what did you have in response to the question? Um, my thought was I actually went to the dictionary, <laughs> and I looked up um, sympathy, Yeah, and it just means same feeling. Um, or same um, suffering in some cases. Um, and what I realized is that we were trying to like separate out sympathy yep. and um, what was the other one? Um, we were talking about rapport and sympathy. Yeah, and, and I rapport. was trying to, and, and this is where I feel like I tried to oversimplify it so that some intellectual light bulbs will go on, but it's not that simple. So I want to add that to last week's teaching, you know? <laughs> yeah, so go ahead. Yeah. So my thought was that the um, law of rapport is just an example of the sympathetic attraction. And what Krishna's talking yes. about is the whole sympathetic attraction where he includes both the good and the bad, the, exactly. the errors and the, the loving. Yeah. Um, and that made a lot more sense to me. And then rapport is just where it... Um, where it applies to, for example, um, a medium and a person who's sending the information. It, yeah, having rapport between the spirit and yeah. the person on earth. Yep. Yeah, yep. and that's just part yes. of it. Yes, exactly. Okay. Beautiful. Awesome. So, great. Did anyone else have any other reflections around sympathy and love? Yep. If we go to Karen. Well, I assumed that we were supposed to come out at the other end saying that sympathetic attraction is all bad <laughs> because of the codependence thing. And I started thinking, like, um, what about a mother and a baby? That's got to start off being good because there's a dependence and, sure, it's not good when the, the dependence... when a person can be independent but chooses not to be... And then I thought about, like, severely disabled. And then I thought about the frail aged, the people caring for them. And um, it, it sort of seemed like, in the end, I came to, yeah, it's still always OK to help those people as long as you want to, because there are a lot of people who don't want, who want to stay dependent. So now you're talking more about dependence rather than codependence? Yeah. yeah, one being dependent and the other one providing. Yeah, so this, okay, this is where I feel like I agree that when we love, we will give to people and we will love them. Mm -hmm. But we won't, we, when we love, we won't support codependence. I, I feel that's quite clear. It, if we have an injury, we might enter codependence. And the loving part of that is the opportunity we have to change, because when we step out of codependence, then we can, both parties grow. 
But when you're talking about dependence versus codependence, I think they're two different things. I agree when a baby's born, they're dependent on their mother and love does um, assist them in any way they can. That's a sympathetic attraction. Graham asked this question last week as well. I don't know that it's a sympathetic attraction. It's a mother and a baby. I, um, there is, yes, there's an attraction between the personality of the mother and the personality of the soul half that's attracted to her. But I don't... Is that what you mean? I was thinking more in terms of um, the baby needs something and the mother wants to provide, and so it's like the angry and the afraid attraction. And it, it works as long as the mother remembers to stop providing when the baby can do for or the child can do for itself. Yeah, and again I feel this is some this is some emotions that you're working through yeah. <laughs> around yourself. And just beware of trying to put everything into a box. Okay. I feel lots of us want to put it into a box to understand and say, so oh this is like this and that is like that and you know that means I can this is bad and that is good. It's not like that. And so I feel like we need to understand the lesson of sympathetic attraction, wh how attractions occur, the opportunity to respond lovingly in, in every attraction. But when we try to say, okay, mothers, daughters, what, what does it all mean? I feel there now we're starting to avoid some emotion and try to understand it. for yourself. I feel that's what's happening. Can you relate to that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's still that, you know, there's... People that, who have lived their whole lives and they're now in a physical condition where they can't care for themselves because they haven't wanted to deal emotionally, eventually, like if everybody treats them lovingly, there's going to be nobody left to care for them. And I kind of ground to a halt then thinking like, I don't know the answer to this <laughs> anymore. But so what do you th what, how do you think we treat someone who's frail and aged with love? Well, I, I did come to... It's like the golden rule. I would want to be cared for even if I didn't want to get myself better and let God worry about, you know. <laughs> well, and this is, this is, again, where we need to be careful of ethics versus morality as well, isn't it? If we are willing, if we... This is where I often fall down with the golden rule. I often say it to AJ. I'm like, there's a, babe, there's a lot of things I've wanted in my life that it weren't good. I was willing to give them to people and they were willing to give them back to me and it wasn't actually a good thing. So I get really like, I need morality. I need God because I can't. I don't want to rely on my human frailty for all this. For myself, I, yes, you could enter it with the ethical perspective. I want to be cared for, so I'll care for you. But the truth is that person's not going to care for you. They're going to be passed. So is it really ethics? Um, not so much care for you, but when, if I were in your position, I would want somebody to care for me. Yeah, but can you see there's a big distinction? If I'm willing to care for Luli when she's sick and she's willing to care for me when I'm sick, that's ethics. If I want Luli to care for me while I'm 80 and she wants someone to care for her when she's 80 but by the time she gets to 80 I'm going to be dead, who's Luli got the ethical arrangement with? It's not with me because I'm dead or oh, past. Okay. Can you see the difference? Yeah. So I, I feel that there's a lot, I don't know, I can just feel your resistance to it. So. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and wanting to get cared for. <laughs> And the truth, the truth is, by the time we're old and frail and aged, there's a lot of error that we've been living in for a long time. So my question for everyone is, how do you respond lovingly with someone like that? That was my question, yeah. yeah. AJ? Can I just say to you, Karen, in your questions, there were five or six total unloving statements that you made. And... We're, Mary's not willing to say that to you, which is an issue that Mary's got, obviously. But, but man, like you've heard so much about divine truth already, and yet there are so many inconsistencies in what you said and what, in your statements. For example, as Mary pointed out, the issue of ethics. With the issue of ethics, it's not ethical for somebody to ask you to look after them. Now, if you want to give them the gift of your time to look after them, that's a gift of love. They are two separate things, and yet you can't see that. 
And, and like I'm fairly surprised actually that after all this time you can't see that. So there's got to be inside of you quite a lot of unfair based emotions where you believe love doesn't always result in a person being looked after or cared for. And that's not true at all. You, you made a statement, for example, that if we were all loving, there'd be no old people ever cared for. You, you actually said that. Yeah. And, and I can't agree with that at all. If we're loving, we would decide whether we want to care for them or not. But it wouldn't be based on an ethical decision because they are totally incapable of loving us. So it would have to be whether we're willing to give the gift of our love or not. And, and these are... It feels to me that, that you still have very much going on inside of yourself, the bartering system, that you're interpreting as, uh, as love. And, and this is a big issue to address. If, if, because if, if you analyse this video again uh, over, you will see that you made many statements that indicate the lack of understanding about love still that's inside of yourself. And one of the things I wanted to say to the group generally, and I feel Mary has probably said this before, without processing emotion, it is impossible to come to understand love. You can sit here and go through all this intellectual banter with Mary, asking question after question, what's right here, what's right there, and all those kind of things. But the reality is, if love was in your heart, you wouldn't even need to ask those questions. Those questions would be superfluous. You, you would not need to ask them because love would be already be in your heart and you'd already know what to do in every single situation, automatically. You'd autom automatically know what was loving. Does that make sense? And, I... and the fact that you don't is got nothing to do with asking Mary another question. You need to feel more about what love is rather than asking Mary question after question because all of the questions you asked today, I felt all come from this heart that doesn't understand love yet. So the key is to pray more about what love would actually do. And is there ever a time when love isn't a gift? Of course there is not. So, so we would all have the opportunity, as Mary will show you later, to demonstrate charity to people, but, but don't think that charity is always ethical because mm -hmm. it's a gift. It's inherent in it, actually, is the fact that there is no expectation that someone would do the same for you. It is a gift of love. Mm. If I can just extend on what AJ's just been talking about, a feeling I often feel from the group, and you're right, I don't articulate it, is a real anger about this love thing. Mm. You know, a lot of you have grown up feeling like love is barter. That's how you understand love. I give this nice thing, I get another nice thing, and that's how it works. Then someone comes along and says, guys, that's just addiction. <laughs> and then there's a real anger, I feel, in a lot of people, and it's behind a lot of questions sometimes, of, hey, that, you know, well, what is this love thing? It means I'm never going to get a nice feeling. I'm never going to get any, you know, I, it, how do I, well, we, someone said right back at the beginning, well, there is no real friends anyway, and, you know, it's like love doesn't even exist. It's all just been a, a, an addiction. And I feel like you're still in the breakup phase with the, you know, love is barter. <laughs> you're still, you know, breaking up with that relationship, having some tantrums. You need to have a big cry about the fact that it's not going to go that way that you think it was. The truth is actually far more exciting and beautiful. Cardi, would you mind just letting... Um, there's someone at the back door wanting to get in. Um, it's far more exciting and beautiful. And this idea of actually receiving something from a space of love or giving something from a space of love, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your heart. It's going to, you know, it'll be amazing. But you have to get over this phase where you're like, well, that's it, I'm not getting anything nice anymore, you know? <laughs> Because actually, if you really feel into it, you'll feel how draining the barter system has been. It's been horrible. There's always guilt and expectation and all this, oh, I've got to do it right, and otherwise I won't be loved or I won't be approved of and all of that. When in actual fact, when you're actually in a loving relationship, it's like a relief. All you have to do is be yourself and give of yourself. But we have to go through the breakup with barter 
And I agree with what AJ mentioned to you, Karen. There's a lot of anger in you about, well, if we're all loving, no one would get cared for. I, like, I see the complete opposite. Did you not see what happened with Marie in here? What was happened with every single person we've met in this book? They are being loved and cared for. Um, in, in just even in the entire environment that's around them, let alone the people they're interacting with. So I would go back to the emotion that you have behind that, that feeling and really have the breakup. Okay, Deb, you had your hand up there. I'm not sure if I misunderstand something, but what didn't make sense to my mind was when maybe it was you're addressing Karen, uh, Karen, is um, how the golden rule is the barter thing, kind of go about the example with Lu you and Luli, because I felt like, well, if, if uh, say, Joy is, is, is in its, its need of some help, mm -hmm. well, yeah, you just help. You don't make a contract with her that, you know, when I'm 80, I'll get the same back. You know, like it's... N yeah, well... That's, I think, the point that AJ was trying to say. You give out of a sense of love, not out of a sense of, I want something back. And, and if you do apply the golden rule, you, in that situation, I don't feel it fits because we're saying, I want some, you know, I'd be willing to give this to somebody else, but they're not willing to give it to me. But they don't have to because... Um, if you're motivated by love, that's true. They don't have that, to. Yeah, there is, but it's it, not an issue. And because of the Bible, you know, phrase, as you sow, so shall you reap. Well, if I've given to Joy and she's gone on to higher realms um, past and then I, um, I'm i still here, well, hopefully maybe Lena might. <laughs> someone will come. God will send someone because if the need is there. But I guess the issue is what's in our hearts. What is driving every one of these interactions? Is it addiction? Is it contracts? Is it demands? Is it expectations? Is it guilt? Because if it's any of those things, it's not love. And so my soul and the person I'm giving to is not going to grow through that interaction. And so I'm actually sowing something that isn't love. And so I will reap that. Do you see? And this, so it's not just, I think you guys are you know, familiar with that principle from knowing us for so long. It's not your actions, it's what motivates your actions. And when your heart does change, your actions will change and it will be awesome and loving. Um, but I see people fall down in two areas. One, I'll just change my actions and just kid myself that my soul's a bit better. <laughs> or two, I'll just say I don't have to take any action until my soul is better. And both are actually avoiding the point which is, do you want to grow in love? And if you do, then you'll want to change your soul and your actions. But you won't kid yourself that just by doing one action, it means that you've completely grown in love. And do you disagree, babe? You, no, no, no. I'd, I'd like to say something if I could. Yeah, yeah, sure, go. But I don't want to stop you from <laughs> your flow. <laughs> That's all right, I'm done. Um, Deb, I feel again, you're a bit out of line there with, with your comments, because it's like, firstly, with regard to the situation you brought up, let's say Joy needs your assistance. You decide out of love to give her that assistance. That doesn't mean that when you need assistance, anybody is going to assist you. It doesn't mean that. Because that's no, a contract. What about no, as you sow, so shall you reap? But there's, but there's no guarantee of that. No, there's no. No, but, but you, you think there is. Oh. This is the emotion inside of you that goes, if I look after Joy and I look after that person, I look after... When I need help, who's looking after me? <laughs> do, do you see what I'm saying? The Bible now, says I should. <laughs> now, that tells you that the reason why you're looking after Joy and the other person oh. is really so that you can say, who's looking after me when you need <laughs> help, right? And, and that is the demand. That's the addictive demand. So that's not love. You're not looking after Joy out of love under those circumstances. If you're looking after Joy out of love... You wouldn't have later on a feeling, well, I need help now, who's looking after me? You, and, and by the way, it wouldn't be ethical either because you've helped only Joy. So that means from an ethical point of view, Joy should be the only one that helps you. Now, if you've given her the gift of love, she shouldn't have to do anything. 
So, so but, either but way, it's faulty. It, how is it? Um, how is ethics involve joy giving back to me? Because I wouldn't assume. I wouldn't. That doesn't make sense to me. Well, that's that, what I'm saying. Love is a mm, gift. L yeah. Love, <laughs> like yeah. that's what I've said right at the beginning. And and I feel that's the thing you're not seeing because you don't believe love is a gift yet. Even though you say the words, the reality is in, there's a feeling, and you're going. I looked after joy. Someone else, when I need help, should come and look after me because God has a law that says what you sow, you reap. And I've sown all this help to other people. When, when am I going to reap some help for myself? That is a demand. That's not the law. Like you demand, God would be, God's laws are all going, no, sorry, she's in demand. She's not, she's not actually given out of a heart that's free to love. If you had given uh, from a heart that's free to love, then certainly you would reap the rewards of that. But, but your statements are indicating that you wouldn't be doing so if later on you feel that you need help and somebody else should be helping you. Mm -hmm. And this is where I feel there's no understanding about love, as I, like I was saying with Karen. That, like, love doesn't have those later on demands. It doesn't sort of say, it never says, oh, I've helped all these other people, so you should help me. We had a, a in, interaction. You're just buzzing because yeah. of the, because you're close to the. And I'll uh, just knock down my. And we had an interaction recently with a um, with a lady who demanded interviews from us, and and she said to us, "I've given my time to other people, so you should give your time to me." Basically, that's what she said. And and I would argue that if she is making that as an argument, she is basically saying that because she's given her times to other people, then other people should give things to her. And that means that the whole reason why she was giving things to other people was flawed. So, so it's not love. She's just doing it out of barter. So, so I feel this is happening a lot with, with different people, right? And Deb, I feel there's that you're falling down where you're going, ethics, love, addiction. I don't understand what's going on. You're saying... If you're motivated by love, you don't have any expectation. And yet, as AJ pointed out, there is this feeling in you of, like, I should get something if I give something, which is actually the addiction. And it's missing the lesson around the ethics, which is, am I... If I'm treating... I would treat Barbara in a way that I would like her to treat me. Now, it doesn't follow that I would treat Barbara in a way that I would like Cavill to treat me. Because I'm, it doesn't... Have any, I'm not thinking about how I'm treating Cavill. If I'm, if, I'm 80, if I'm 60 and my mother's 80 and I think, well, I'll look after my mum because I want my 40-year-old daughter to look after me, so I do all this stuff for my mum, I've actually got an expectation on my daughter and I'm not even thinking about how I'm treating her, I'm just thinking about how I'm treating my mum. And that's not ethical. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. If we go, Glenda... And then somewhere at the back, if you pass back, yes. Um, the idea of that we sow, we reap what we sow. Like if I help somebody out of love or I do something for you, um, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to receive the same in return. Like no. I finished work at one o'clock last night, so driving home, you know, I could have easily have fallen asleep, had a car accident and nobody found me. But that if I have been helping people, then that affects my soul. I mean, truly out of love. So then I reap the benefits of an improved soul, not necessarily like for like return. Exactly. And this is where it's exactly this whole lesson theme that we're talking about where we're not understanding love. We're still thinking it's barter. And it's much better than barter. It's way better. Like the benefits of growing your soul in love far exceed somebody else just helping you when you're sick. Like it's a whole universe changing event growing in love and so you're very right mm. that's very right yeah yeah if we go back to Jules yep oh Mary I was just going to ask if you give to somebody and you get the generosity back to say thank you that's really beautiful and then you go into shame what's that is that barter to. This is great because this is really where we're headed with charity because there's a lot of emotions that affect our ability to receive and give and the, the stuff that I wanted to talk about around charity, yeah. So 
what do you guys think it is when you feel all icky when someone gives when you give something and then somebody um, somebody expresses their gratitude and you go oh what's that what do you think it is you said shame but what's yes, the feeling I feel um, I feel it's so little I should have done more um, and I feel so Im- guilt it's, it's like a guilty feeling yeah yeah, yeah. Um, that I don't deserve to be thanked and that it tarnishes the gift of what I've given. It's not like that. Do I really, really expect the expectation of the thank you and then when I get it, (laughs) do I then go, oh, I don't deserve it? You know, I don't. (laughs) So um, have you always felt like this when people express gratitude or just in recent years? Oh, fairly much always. Always, yeah. Yeah. So it's a feeling that's been with you since childhood. Yeah, Yeah. that I don't deserve the thank you. And then I go, I then go into the doubt of, oh, did you give that for the thank you? Or do you know, then I sort of end up attacking yourself. Muckiness about it. And then I think, oh, gosh, I wish they hadn't thanked me. (laughs) (laughs) So So I'll quickly leave. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. Does anyone else do that? Does anyone else relate to that feeling? Yeah. Yeah. Quite a few people. Yeah. What other emotions come up around giving and receiving for people? If you pass back to Matthew, we'll come. We, I'm not done, Julie. We'll talk more about it. But yeah. Um, for me, sometimes like I have this feeling like I I want to give something to someone, but then I have this lo- a lot of fear that oh, like there'll be nothing for me. Yeah. I have a very strong fear yeah. about that. Yeah. 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 feel angry about having this maybe feeling that I'd like to give sometimes. <laughs> it sounds a bit contradictory, I guess. But you, so, you, have, you feel, what was that like, last like, week? Like a bit angry that I have to give. Well, not, yeah. I don't even know how to. Yeah. So I feel there's two really big emotions that affect at our ability to give and receive. One is a feeling of like... Um, Guilt and shame, well, let's start with the feeling of lack. That's where most people struggle, hey? So that's what you are talking about last there, Matthew, where you feel like, I don't know that there's going to be enough for me. (laughs) And, you know, so I I don't really want to give, although I think I should, so I will, but then I just feel like it's not that pure and it doesn't feel that good. Um... Or I'm a bit angry that I've got to give because I don't feel like I'm going to be loved or cared for myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of yeah. like a desire to, like you can see that there's a, an opportunity to be able to give something that might really benefit a person. Yeah. And then like just this, my anger is probably a bit more towards God, my projection anyway about that. Yeah, but there's a feeling that you're avoiding with that anger, isn't there, which is I feel yeah. about lack, about I'm not going to be loved or cared for. Yes. And it's really not... God that you're angry with, is it? It is actually that person, isn't it? Or it is this, it's, you're angry about this feeling. It ends up being a projection towards that person. Yeah, so it ends up harming them. Sorry? It ends up harming them then. Mm. Yeah, don't, this is the other place where we go self-punishment. You don't need to punish yourself about it. Just be real about it, what's really going on, and have, com- have compassion for yourself about it. If someone else was telling you this story, you'd be a lot more. I know you'd be a lot more compassionate towards them about, you know, the fact that they get a bit angry because they're really afraid of not having anything. But when you see it in yourself, you're like, oh man, I'm hurting other people. Oh, I'm bad, you know. <laughs> so it's, yeah, that's just an avoidance as well. Really. Yeah, it is. It is, and it's a way of, you know, you're not going to grow that way. You're going to need to have compassion for not. Not let yourself get away with badness, but also have compassion for it and a desire to shift through it. Yeah. Okay, the second one that I, that I really feel about is this, it comes back to the first lesson that we were just talking about, and it's about all of the emotions that we've been taught around barter. And I think this is more, Jules, is what's happening for you, is that, so we've been taught that... Um, we should give things in a bartering way. And then, you know, then it gets all complicated. Even when you, like sometimes I feel you have a very sincere desire to actually give something. But then when you get something, 
you go, hang on, now this feels like barter and it feels off and I don't know, hang on, I just wanted to give. And, and it's actually not that anything in error has happened inside you or them, but you have a whole set of emotions around love being barter and feeling like um, there's a lot of obligation and guilt around giving. Can anyone else relate to that? Yeah, yeah. And I feel that this is... Who, who else... How do you go with that question about charity? Does anyone else have some um, ideas of when charity was displayed to them and stuff? Lorleen? Um, I had trouble finding anything that I was particularly charitable about. Mm -hmm. um, and I came to the feeling that um, I did things um, through uh, a sense of uh, approval. So that wasn't obviously charity, but I yeah. did. Uh, I was trying to find what was really charitable. And I found that for myself, I came into two categories. And one of them was I did for approval or I did out of rebellion or didn't do out of rebellion. Yeah. And I had to find in between, now well, what is charitable then? And this understanding of love coming mm -hmm. through of whatever I did had to be done with total understanding that it doesn't matter what I do, that I wouldn't get necessarily anything back. And I often had this story in my head about Christmas time, you know, give and take. You know. yeah. And, and um, someone pointed out to me that when you give a gift, it's given and it doesn't matter if they stomp on it and chuck it in the bin or, you know, all these things. Once it's given, if you have any recall to it, any, any notion, whatever, it was not a gift. Yeah. And, and I took that in terms of um, trying to be of service, trying, you know, material or how I felt. And um, so I, I saw that basically everything in terms of charity was, again, the attitude of my soul, how yes. I felt towards yeah. everything. Yeah. And then, then I could see, okay, it didn't matter how big or small a gesture was to me or to anyone. It was in the light of an instantaneous, almost spontaneous, I want to, yeah. and not go through, oh, if I do this, I'll get that. You know, yeah. that's when it... You can forget it. You can forget it. Yeah. Charity's left the building. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Nice reflections, and definitely, I agree. It's, it's a, it's the spirit in t in the action or in the word, in the service, in the gift that qualifies it as charity. Yeah, yeah. So who who came up with some ways that they felt charity was displayed towards them? Sherry. I've just put under this barter the two emotions that we often have associated, guilt and obligation. Yep, sorry, Sheridan. Um, I reflected on a therapist I've been seeing for the last few weeks and during the treatment I feel her gift of love without addiction is opening me up a lot emotionally. Yep. And how, when I was a therapist, like, the contrast, like, her love and strong desire for service. Yeah. And I feel there's... That she doesn't want anything back from me. It's a pure gift. Yeah, and yeah. It's been very overwhelming. Yeah, lovely. Okay, who else? Uh, Lizzie? It was one that happened about just before we started. As you know, there's a fire going on just yeah. up from our property. And I sort of felt, shall I come? Shall I not come? And no, I, obviously there's fear there. Um, but anyway, um, the real estate guy who actually sold the property to us, he actually pulled up because the fire engines and everything down there. And he just said, I just want to let you know, Lizzie, we're looking after you. We know your property's here. It's all under control. Um, and we're just taking care of you. Okay, you're okay. <laughs> So I came. Yeah. And it was beautiful. I really felt he didn't have to do that. He just yeah. stopped just to say, it's all under control. Everything's okay. We know you're there. Yeah. <laughs> Very kind. Mm. That was one of the ones that I, um, that I had on my list was the Rural Fire Brigade. You know, there was a huge fire near our place recently and there was just guys in trucks down there working all day just giving me this gift of a safe home. You know, without them, it would have been pretty 
dangerous and scary. They're, they're volunteers. They're all volunteers, all do it on their own time, they train on their own time, you know, yeah, I felt there's a lot of instances of that. Uh, when we were at home recently, we had um, a bird's nest disturbed and AJ and I were looking after them, feeding them and stuff, but to properly care for them, they needed to have an aviary where they could you know, go through this graded release back and we couldn't do it. So we called the wildlife carers and they came and took them. What a huge act of charity, you know, something that has happened on our property that we want to take responsibility for. And these people are here saying, it's okay, we'll come and, we'll come and get, it, get the birds from you, we'll look after them. And, and we gave them quite a big donation because we just felt what a, what a beautiful thing they're doing. The same yeah. thing happened too. There was a little baby magpie about three weeks ago on the road through the forest there. And Lucy said, stop, Mum, there's a baby bird. And we picked it up, phoned up the RSPCA, who gave us the name of this woman. And she said, oh, no, I'll meet you halfway there at um, Wattle Camp, is it? I don't know. Wattle Camp. It's the other side of King Roy, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's the same lady. It's the she said, oh, I'll come yeah. straight away. I went, oh, OK. She said, but I'll meet you halfway because it's a long way. And there she took it with her. Yeah. And again, just voluntary, just loves the wildlife. And yeah. in her, she had this little handbag. It was a, a cloth one. And inside was this tiny, weeny little baby possum yeah. that had been abandoned. And she yeah. was 24-7 carrying it around with Looking her. Looking after Not, not yeah. wanting anything in return. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very beautiful, hey? Yeah. Who else saw charity in their day-to-day lives? Monique? Um, I was, um, when I was feeling about it, I was looking around and seeing um, the government. Like, I feel really grateful about the government, things that I've rebelled against very strongly and um, criticised authority. Now I see that they just give so much. The council's like toilets. When I need to go to the toilet, there's a toilet. Or I need to put my rubbish in a bin and there's a bin. And when you travel overseas, you really recognise what gifts we're given by our, our municipalities because a lot of places there's no public toilets, not even heard of. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then also I, I had a question that I felt grateful in things that, that I paid money for, like, like the roads. I, I didn't understand if that was charity. I felt it was, even though I paid something, something tiny compared to what I actually receive yeah. or if I, I am... Um... Well, I suppose it's, this, it's the spirit in which it's given that, as we said earlier, that defines it as charity. So, but now you're talking about something called gratitude as well, which is really beautiful and it's, it's not even necessarily dependent on the spirit in the person who's doing the giving. You can be really grateful. Do you see? Yeah, I do, but also I feel like like I paid money for something today that it was done with the most kindness, loving heart that I, I just thoroughly enjoyed, like those Koyo yogurts and ice creams. <laughs> yeah. And um and but you could taste the love in it. Yeah. Like the, this man dedicated his whole life to producing something vegan. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I feel like that was charity as well. Yes, I agree. There's, because it's a condition in his heart that you're feeling, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah. So does in charity... Yeah, see now where you want to go? <laughs> Do you feel mm. it? You want a box. Mm. And I'm saying it's the condition in the heart that defines it as charity. Mm. And you can't put a box on that. You can't say, well, if you pay for it, it's not charity. Because you you that didn't do feel that. right anyway. Yeah, yeah. God's not up there with like a tally book going, right, tabulate that, that one's paid for, no, that's, uh, no, 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 okay, sorry, this, this list of your <laughs> transactions means your soul is in this sphere, no, it doesn't happen like that, yeah, yeah, okay, Denise? Um, I just listed so many, but um, some of them was that God has built gifts of potential into our souls and he has no expectation of us to use that. The charity that you guys have extended to us to deliver the truth from God to help us in our development. That I've been given the opportunity to become at one with God. I've been given the opportunity to receive his love if I want it. 
We've been given the gifts of truth through the divine channelings that you guys have done and through the pageant messages. And through these books, they were all gifts to us that, that I'm so grateful for. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. Thanks, Denise. I agree. What an act of charity on Fred's part, hey? And, Kush- and all these people who made this possible. Robert, yeah. Yeah. Who else? Uh, yeah, if we go back to Di and over to Deb. And then we'll come forward to Jen. So we go Di first, yeah? Yeah, I just feel like every day in the shop, there's people that serve me without self-interest and can really feel the difference. Yeah. Those that are there because they're just earning the money and they've got this dutiful, got to say this to you, or somebody on the road who allows you to pass when there's no written rule that says they have to and it's just this open, I don't know, thing that happens. Yeah. 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 Uh, and they're just beautiful things. They you know, are. That are I agree. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Deb, and if you pass forward to Jen on this side. Oh, I just felt it was my guides, you know, that they're on call 24-7. And I just, I was really amazed at that. that yeah. And I, and I often say, like, please, guys, go, go enjoy your life. Like, how can... Can't be much fun hanging out with me all day, you know. Oh, oh Deb. So, they were, you don't know how much they love you. And I actually, it actually dawned on me a couple of weeks ago that for all of the love that I didn't get as a child, my guides are just giving it to me now and, and more. And more than, than it, it's, it's such a contrast, you know. Yeah, they have a really personal interest in you. And, it's yeah. happening now. The yeah. parenting I didn't get is happening now. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, Jen. Um, I really related to um, what Matthew said about the feeling of lack. Mm-hmm. And this week in thinking that I understood charity, I asked God to show me what charity and joy was. Mm-hmm. And... My prayer must have been sincere because um, Graham's had a busted... It's a funny example. Graham's had a busted roller door and the little birds have come flying into the shed and um, I wouldn't have noticed. But we looked up and we found baby birds in a nest in the top of the shed and the sense of joy that I felt, um, it just... I'll, I constantly come from a place of feeling lack and feeling needy, but in that space where I saw the little birds and the mother, so, we were so close to it, watching it, Graham and I, and um, I had a moment's breathing space out of that injury of lack and neediness and felt real joy, and I felt that that was charitable towards me that I had had the guidance, I guess. That you were given the experience to see something so precious, you mean? Yes, I think yeah. so. I'm having trouble trying to explain. Yeah, yeah. But that in that moment I kind of had a breath away from the normal injury that I live in of neediness and feeling uh, I lack this or life lacks that or the world's not giving me this. Sure. That deep sure. needy space and yeah. felt the joy of... These little, these little tiny little birds being fed and being in nature and I'm having trouble explaining it, but that's, that's what okay. I felt was a very charitable moment. I didn't know, I don't really know where the charity came from, whether it was from my guide or directly from God or it was from the law of desire or where, what the box is. <laughs> yeah. But I just felt Let's that, not get that a box. was charity. Yeah, so you were given a gift. Without any, just a gift for your joy and pleasure. Okay. Uh, if we go, ooh, if we go back to Christiana and forward here to Barbara. Yep, Barbara. Oh, me too. Yeah. oh sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. I said Christiana okay. first, but it's taking yeah. a while. So. Um, I was brought up um, with lack all of my life, and my parents had big injuries about lack. Yeah. But I've spent my whole life as an adult. Um, giving and enjoy giving, but I had to reflect with this question this weekend. Well, was that giving that I've given, um, selective giving? Um, Was it given out of rebellion? 
um, because of where I came from. Yeah. And um, I got to the position where it was a combination of sometimes it was pure and sometimes it was out of rebellion and sometimes it was bartering. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but my question on that really was because I grew up in a situation of such lack and I enjoy giving so much, um, I still don't know whether, I still haven't got it right, whether, whether it's coming from love or whether it's coming from the other things. <laughs> Bob, I feel you're a really giving person. That comes from your heart. Yeah. And I feel it's a testament to your lovely soul. Yeah. And you, you can feel where it's off. And, you know, yeah. But, and I feel like your guides are giving you some confirmation of that as well. Yeah. That you just do have a lovely giving spirit inside of you. Yeah. And a lot of grief about not being given to yourself. Christiana? One of the lovely things that I've discovered about um, charity is prayers. The prayers that um, people out of their own generosity in the heart just, you know, um, extend to you and, and go to God on your behalf. Yeah. And I think that's really beautiful and, and such a beautiful gift that we can do for, for others. And um, in particular, I really um, love the idea that we can do so much for our spirit friends in, and, and for the malevolent spirits who may be around us, that we can um, just ask God to just wrap her loving arms around them and, and take them to the, her heart. Yeah, that we can pray for them, but also that we can um, actually give to them, can't yeah. we? Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's beautiful. Who, who listened to the channelings that we did of the people who came? Yeah, lots of you, hey? What did you guys feel about that? Uh, yep, Yvonne? Um, sorry. <laughs> um, I just wanted to follow on from something that Barbara said and it leads into that. It's okay. Um, I mean, my life is a testament to charity, you know. I'm living on a block of land that was a gift and there's a house coming down the road tonight. And, and, um, but not just those big things. The, um, like everyone who comes on the property to help with the work and, um, and the people in Kingaroy that I deal with. Um, I, it's just a joyous experience that for everyone who's interacted with it. It's just been really lovely. Yeah. And I'm really grateful for those things. But then um, I, something Barb said is the same for me. I feel that um, in giving, I'm selective. And I remember one of the earlier chapters in this book that it brought up for me about God is not a... Um, oh, what does he say? He's not a um, respecter of, mm -hmm. of persons. Of persons. Yeah. And... Um, and so, I, you know, amongst my friends, I'm very generous in giving, but I wonder how much of that is actually barter because it's a... Yeah. So the truth is I think it's in that area and I'm very generous within that area. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to move to an area where I'm actually freely giving to the person in front of me or the person next to me or whatever that is. And, and the channelings um, brought that home for us on the weekend and that was that... What they feel from us more than anything is our, our judgment of them, yeah. which is totally unloving. And so really most of my reflection in the last few days has been on that. And, and what I would like to be able to do is just move to a place where it, I'd be just totally loving to whatever person or spirit was next to me um, and not having judgment. And I know that I've had judgment about any person who wasn't like me, basically. You yeah. know, this is my box, and anyone who's in a different box, I've got judgments about. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. Um, I, I received some really, um, some really interesting homework via email, and I wanted to reflect some of it, and some of it follows on from what you're saying there, Yvonne. Um, Eloisa from Kentucky sent me this awesome homework, and at the end of it, she says. I have so much to learn, I don't really understand anything. And I think, well, actually, you could probably run this session of the book group because it's pretty amazing. But she said this thing about... Um, she was talking about sympathy, but she started to talk about judgment. And she said... Um, 
she realised that sympathetic attractions are loving as it's God's way to get through to me about how I truly am when I'm blatantly in denial of that fact. Um, But she says here, I have often felt annoyed or judgmental of someone or someone's behaviour. And when I reflect a bit on that, I realise that the judgement and annoyance comes due to the fact that I wanted to be better than that and I'm not. It's almost like judgment is the anger at myself directed at another. Also, usually the person is doing things, saying things that I do and say. In fact, sometimes they are so exactly like me that it's really confronting, almost uncanny, especially when it's the parts I don't like about myself and I don't usually want to spend a lot of time with them which is also confronting as I sometimes think, wow, I really don't want to spend a lot of time with myself. And in really genuine moments, I can see what it must be like to be around me at times. And it is not the glossy fabricated image I have. Um, So I thought her point was very interesting about judgment. We often say, oh, if you're different, I'm judging you. But very often it's when we're so the same that we end up judging. And it's the resistances to the things that we have in ourselves that she's talking about that we end up projecting outwards. Can anyone else relate to that? You know, and I've had that experience where this person annoys me so much. And I think, oh, you know, they're just... And I, you know, I'm telling myself a big story about how they're not like me. And if really, in that horrible place, I'm saying, if they were more like me, everything would be better. And then I turn around and go, they're just me. That's just exactly my injury that's being shown to me. Yeah. I often, you know, display a lot more grace and compassion for people who have a different story until I start to really process my own story, then, of course, I can have huge compassion for everyone. And I can also relate to a lot of people in pain who have my story. But when I'm at the beginning of that journey, there's usually a lot of judgment that comes out of us towards people who are actually quite a bit like us in ways that we don't want to see. And that's what Eloise is saying. She's saying, God's bringing me this truth all the time and I'm just responding in... Anger, but I'm starting to see it's actually a lot about me. Yeah. Um, I just, there was a couple of other things she said that I thought were really good about charity. She said um, that she found it quite challenging because she had issues with the word charity. Did anyone else find that? Like, oh, what is this old word? bit churchy (laughs) but um, yeah she felt she couldn't she couldn't really relate to it so she looked it up and um, she found kindness and tolerance in in judging others and a love of humankind but she said she felt the people who extend the most charity to her in her life are her husband and her children Um, they they are often and and she says and AJ and Mary they be around my unloving behaviour and they want to help me grow, which is a huge act of charity, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was lovely that she found charity right there beside her. Yeah. Alex? I've um, actually been feeling this week that um, how charitable God is and um, just because... We recently spent a day just eating the weeds out of our garden. And um, it's the first time I realised God's taking care of me. I'm not going to die. Yeah. <laughs> and there was like 10 different types of weeds that I could yeah. eat. And I actually yeah. really enjoyed them. Yeah. They tasted really good. When we were in Sweden, just this year we did, we spent a week the same, just eating off the, the ground and what was around. And it was really delicious. Yeah. 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 And I just, for the first time I realised there's, there's food everywhere. Yeah. And there's water, and yeah. I don't need anything else. Yeah. It's like it rains, I get wet so wide. Yeah. And it was just this, oh, I don't know, the first time I, I thought, I'm just going to get on my bike and I bought a little trolley, Yeah. and I'm just going to go, because I don't need anything else. Like, and it's the way that I really want to live my life, and I'm going to have like these little adventures. Because I feel like you know, we stay in the one place out of fear often too, you know, like this is where we feel comfortable. and want to feel yeah. secure. And, yeah. 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 So, anyway, so I just, yeah, I just felt like God really does look after us, you know. There's, yeah, he does. So I just felt, yeah, yeah, he's a pretty charitable God. He is. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason we're talking about this, though, hey, is because Fred and Kushner enter the 
to the cold air of the earth plane. And he says it's cold because of the lack of charity here, basically. And, and this is why I was asking you guys to reflect, how am I charitable? Because this, this is what's affecting this sphere around me, how much I, I want to give from a loving space. Yeah, yeah. A um, couple of other things. For, does anyone else have any comments around charity? Yeah, if we go to Matthew and then back to Diana. Yeah. Um, for my own experience, I think the most beautiful charity um, I, what I'm finding is the charity that comes from God and from my guides and just from people around me in that, in assisting and encouraging me in the process of taking personal responsibility is like, so the most beautiful charity. Yeah. Like, and yeah. these fears, I'll, you know, I'll have to do it all myself and things like that. And then taking a step forward and then there's this person there that provides this charitable gift inspired by love to assist that. And it's like a... Yeah, I feel really grateful. Yeah. And I suppose the question is, does it inspire us to embody the same things? Because I feel if we are grateful for the gift, like truly, it does inspire us. If we really receive those gifts, then it inspires us to want to offer those gifts to other people as well, doesn't it? That same love and that same... That's part of what has inspired us for 2,000 years, the receiving of that love and then wanting to be able to offer that to other people and help people receive it themselves. Yeah. If you go next to you, to Renee, and who was over here? Di. If, if we just go to Di first, Renee, and then we'll come over to you. Yeah. It's just more about the, the judgment thing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I'd put down about how I could, you know, was being becoming, I felt like becoming more charitable in yeah. my life was um, about being more aware of the, my own judgments and expectations because I've controlled and denied them for such a long time yeah. um, to avoid feeling a whole lot of things. Um, yeah. And I'm feeling like that is true. Like, I can be more charitable the more I'm aware of that in my engagements with others. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, this is something that we talk about a lot in this group is, hey, we don't have to be perfect before we act. And it's often in the acting, if we've got that noble intention in our heart, that we become perfected. I don't know a way to become perfected without acting in, in, that, in that, you know, high ideal. It's, so I agree with you, Di. You don't have to have it all out of you. Or, but the more aware you are, the more you're able to, to act in a way that isn't in harmony with the bad stuff and is aiming for the great stuff. Yeah, yeah. Renee? Yes, I, I've, I've received a lot of gifts in all different shapes and sizes. And, um, for example, I really desired to assist in a school, a lot, some of the schools in the local area. Yeah. And one lady came into my work and I said, what do you do? What do you do? And I kept asking her and she eventually told me she was a chaplain and she... Um, what she did, and I said, oh, she does breakfast club for kids, right? And I said, oh, I'd love to help. Can I please come and help? And she said, that's amazing. She said, the lady who always helps me has just left and I need someone. So I've been assisting in there for quite a while just because I purely desire to be of assistance. Yeah. And um, just a little thing like at, she offered to cut my hair and I so needed a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so, it so touched me. I was mm -hmm. just really touched by simplicity of that and yeah. um and another lady I work with as well gave me a beautiful Christian book funny enough and I I just thought I just felt the love of that and the care that they had and I just love it <laughs> and, yeah. and and even I received a letter like as well and I found it the other day and I kept it for years and years and years and I just read it last week and when I read it, it actually was all about God. And it said everything in three pages, everything. And I was just crying because I didn't see it back, back then, then when I read it. And yeah. I knew I kept it for a reason. Yeah. But it was just the, 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 this lovely person had gone to the extreme to write me this letter all about God and rebelling. There was lots of things in there for me. Yeah. But um, it was just so beautiful and... 
just yeah. touched my heart. It's very true, that. isn't it? Often we don't actually see charity being extended to us until much later. Yeah, yeah. All right, a few other things I wanted to cover with you guys. Um, Pierre, who's usually here but he's away at the moment, sent me his homework about ch this idea of charity. And um, he's, he said some of these things that we've already been talking about. He said, I've grown up in an atheist environment without God and little of morality lessons, where the bartering system was the only reference as regards to the interactions with others. What can I get from others? How can I get it? And what do I need to give them in return? It's the kind of interactions my parents, friends and teachers taught me. So he said he, he then he came and he realised, intellectually at least, that love is about giving uh, without um, a desire for return, but that he's still struggling with that actual emotion. But he says here... Um, uh, I feel stuck with this bartering emotion, feeling that I'm going to die from cold, loneliness and hunger. I don't trust shelter, food and anything I desire will be provided when I'm purely giving. And this is why I wrote up this, this thing of lack. I feel it really affects most of us when it comes to being charitable. Just living in this fear of not having things causes us to shrink into ourselves and really shrink our world and our potentials. Um, so that was one thing that I thought he pointed out really well and I could feel his feeling about that. He said, um, then when it comes to receiving things, and this reminded me a little bit of what you were talking about earlier, Julie. He says... Um, he, when people are charitable to him, he feels very overwhelmed by love and so grateful for the nobility of the act. It's so inspiring. But at the same time, I have this emotion, emotion of feeling unworthy of receiving a true gift of love. I perceive everyone who wants to give something through my error. As I am, which is wanting something, that they will want something from me in return. I feel so bad to accept it if I don't give something in return, like I have a debt. And this is another thing where I feel a lot of us fall down in both giving and receiving. We don't have that concept of how to... Because we're so trained in this barter system, guilt and obligation just muddy the whole waters. And, it, and if you think about it, it literally muddies the atmosphere, doesn't it, that Fred and Kushner are experiencing. So some big, I feel there's some big lessons there um, that the guys have really talked about eloquently for us to, to work on if we're going to embrace this charitable way of living. Yeah, okay. We've still got a bit of time and I wanted to talk to you guys about the channelings. So we mentioned it briefly, but how did you guys feel listening to some of the spirits who... Um, who attend book group regularly. Deirdre? Um, Mary, they were the first channelings, and I don't know how you feel about um, channeling now, where I felt like there were real people, like they had character, they were animated, they were swearing. <laughs> and I think it was Mandy, the one that is a local Wonder Woman, and yeah. I'm like... We could actually research her to find out she I existed. I'm just like, oh, why didn't you find the date? I wanted to go to the library and, like, get out the old newspapers because I felt like she's just like me, how she feels about the spirit world, how I feel about the earth. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I feel just as lost and alone. I don't know what to do on earth, let alone what to do in the spirit world. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. thought, oh, has she been trying to, like, contact me? Have I brought her here and I just... I, I apologised to her if I was one of the people and I was ignoring her, like, I felt like I needed to apologise to her. <laughs> well, I felt it was a really big lesson, hey, I, and um, I think some of our conversation before and after the channelings was recorded but, and put on the, on the site, but for me, just to, um, to open up and give these people a voice and really understand what they were feeling. Two weeks ago, it felt like there were spirits trying to really shut down the group. And when I talked to them, I was like, 
No, that was the group. These spirits just wanted some help and the group was trying to shut down the spirits. And it was such an amazing lesson for me around mediumship, around, um, you know, when I get really shut down, is it because people are shutting me down or because I just don't want to hear what they want to say because I'm resisting something inside of myself? Yeah, yeah. But I, it felt great to be able to help Mandy, didn't it? And mm. I, I do want to research her. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to go to the library, but I did, it was just like, oh, 70s or 80s. I'm like, when? <laughs> we'll have to talk to her again. We yeah, can. that'd yeah. be awesome. Yeah. And yeah. Kushna, like, I just, I can't wait to meet Kushna. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right, what other reflections did people have about the channeling? If we go Glenda, and then we'll go to... I think she go to Angela behind you first, yeah. What? Um, I was really struck by her very first words. Of, Thank you for finally listening to me. That yeah. really touched me. Yeah, if you just put the mic oh, close to you. That really touched me because yeah. I realised how much I was closed down to not hearing yeah. and not wanting to hear, yeah. out of fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So that kind mm. of her very first words. Really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Glenda. My first instinct was that, oh, look, I'm not very mediumistic, so this doesn't apply to me, you know? Yeah. How can I shut them down if I don't even know they're there? Yeah. But then on, <laughs> ref on reflection, when, you know, as I listen to them talk, you know, we've said here that my beliefs make me blind. Yes. I thought, well, it's my beliefs and my fears that cause me not to be able to see or hear yeah. these spirits as much. So... I thought, well, you know, I'm just as guilty as anybody else, really. Yeah. Um, just that they're, they're definitely a presence here in yeah. this group. And it, it helped me also um, recognise, wow, this group is a little bit more than this 60 or 70 people who come along. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of other people who have an interest in what's going on here. And I agree. It's just yeah. our beliefs that make us blind, yeah. even my own, that, no, it's just a small book group I'm doing just for these. That's a belief that's keeping me blind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just like I, I am, I am becoming more and more aware of spirit influence and what thoughts are not necessarily my own. But it also tends to be more of the malevolent spirits that I'm becoming aware of, not so much the those that want to help me or my guides. Yeah. But um, just like I feel that Mary already that, that channeling helped someone else while I was listening. In that my sister's mother-in-law has had a stroke and is unconscious, and they said that she's resting peacefully. And as soon as I read that, I thought, oh, no, she's not. Mm. And it felt like, you know, how someone's drowning and hanging on to you and you almost at that, you know, yeah. drowning stage yourself. So I pushed her away and said, no, 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 get away, don't want to do that. Then when I was listening to Karen, I felt her again. Yeah. And I just said to her, I can't help you, but listen. You know, actually not, not Karen, it was Mary, the one that lived in Wondi. Man Mandy. Yeah, Mandy, yeah, yeah. Just, just listen to what she's saying while yeah. I'm listening. And yeah. I really, really felt her calm down. Yeah. Now, I don't know whether that's just my imagination or whether it's real, but... I feel you have to trust what you've felt. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. that's what, I'm, that's what yeah. I'm going with. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, she's, she's, her body hasn't passed yet, but she's obviously terrified... Of dying, of dying yeah. and I just just listen to what she has to say, yeah. and it was just a beautiful feeling that you could, I could just feel her calm down as as she spoke about, or as AJ spoke to her about, yeah. you know, being earthbound and how the spirit world is yeah. could be different, awesome. but it's yeah, lovely, yeah, yeah. All right, let's go, Rochelle. You had your hand up, didn't you? No, yep. Um, can we go, is this about, about the second one as well? The, the yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. I would love to talk about the second one I was about to... Okay. Because <laughs> that really cleared up the sympathetic. Because I was still a little bit um, confused about the sympathetic attraction after last yeah. week's discussion. And, yeah. and it just highlighted that it's, you know, is it Karen? That, that Ka Karen, that, Karen, I think yeah, it was, yeah. That she was judging, she was drawn because she was alike that, the us, you know, yes. she, we, we, we were both alike. And yeah. so that's where I was confused about the sympathetic because it was like they're not the same but they can be the same even though... Yeah, it doesn't mean we're exactly the same no. but we just have to have some things in common, common in sympathy. Yeah. Yeah. But it just made it aware. It's like, okay, well, what I'm judging, 
like with Eloise, uh, it, I, yeah. that's me. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so that really highlighted and cleared that up yeah. quite a lot. Awesome. That channeling was really great. That's Thank good. you for that. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. So. Cool. If you pass forward to Cornelius. Um, really struck me how the lady, uh, Mandy, how um, by her not going to the location like where she's supposed to go in the spirit world and being earthbound, how she's really disillusioned. Yeah. Because you had no idea like where her body had gone and what had happened and why she was where she was and how nobody else knew and no one could come and tell her and how she just um, went to locations that she was used to have some sort of feeling of um, something's tangible because nothing else is, mm -hmm. but then try, um, wanting the feelings, noticing the feelings you can get from people and how I can see how overcloaking really quickly can develop yeah. because they don't have the education, no one's told them. Yeah, mm. yeah, and I felt that was a very interesting lesson in, um, again, you know, where we get into judgment about dark spirits and overcloaking spirits and all, and a lot of them are people who... Uh, I was saying to someone before we started, like, five years ago, six years ago, I used to like to go to the pub and get drunk. That means if I had a past then, I'd become a nasty, malevolent, overcloaking spirit, you know. Um, they're re if we could see it, like, they're just people like us. How often are we in our addiction? Now, some of them admittedly have really dark intentions, but many other people who are just, like, lost, kind of existing in this way, like Mandy was, where they going to places that they knew, trying to have experiences that they had because that's their only way of defining themselves in the end because they haven't actually moved on, as you said, to where where more information would be given to them. And that's what I find is on earth it's almost banned, like to talk about spirit stuff. It's really, the yep. church is banned it forever because you'll find out more yep. you know, rather, yeah. than just be, rather than the Bible just being the last word of God. You'll find out a whole lot more of whatever happens. Exactly. And yeah. I know even in myself, it's really challenging for me to do public mediumship because I have all this, you know, I feel like oh, I'm mad, I'm, you know, one of these crazy women, that's how I'm going to be perceived and, um, you know, this is all a bit strange now, isn't it? And all those kind of projections that I've absorbed during my life about mediumship um, and yet I'm shutting down this thing that is going to help like people like Mandy and Karen so much. But also all the mediums on earth that can actually possibly do some good help, like they're disillusioned as well, they don't know a lot of what's going on yeah. as well, so it's probably just adding yeah. error to error. And this is exactly where this whole theme of this chapter where I keep stressing about beliefs making you blind and how more information is actually a good thing. You know, we walk around going, oh, I don't want to see that injury, I don't want to know about that thing, oh, it's just all too much. Um, when really, if we just had more information, we'd be much more empowered to change and do things differently. Yeah, thanks, Corny. If we go, Barb, and back to Peter here. We'll hear from whoever gets the mic first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Peter. <laughs> uh, I was reflecting on uh, the Karen, uh, the Christian uh, yes. spirit, uh, and how she was responding to her perception, just, sorry, okay, yeah. perception, sorry, of that we were... Uh, uh, attacking and uh, our comments. Yes. And it really a, a salutary lesson there for me was that in, in practice, everything we say affects somebody. Yeah. We're very aware of when we're in front of somebody because we get, you know, body language, you get a response. But of course, in spirit, we're affecting both people here and in spirit. Yes. And as somebody, well, for myself, I'm very, very unaware of spirits. Well, I'm working on it. Yeah. But it was a, a very good lesson that everything we say affects somebody here or in spirit world. Yeah. And I've, and not, actually, I've not been aware of that. Before. Yeah. I think it's a good point. And through sympathetic attraction, even just by talking about people, we're likely to attract them. So it will affect them. Mm. Yeah. 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 Interesting point, Barbara. The interesting thing about Mandy was that she had thousands or a thousand with her. I thought I heard a thousand mention or thousands. Thousands, I think. Yeah. yeah. So with your skills of mediumship that you weren't only helping one person, you were helping those thousands. But And it made me reflect on the fact that we, um, and myself, um, are are blind to it mm -hmm. um, because, and, we've, and I've got this blind belief, this belief system that's made me blind 
on the old 20-80% rule. This 20, 80% people in the spirit world that just want help like Mandy yeah. and we've, we're blind to it because we've got this fear based on the 20% that could be malevolent or whatever but yeah. they're still our brothers and sisters and probably the case in most of the situations is that they've not known love from yeah. anybody, let yeah. alone God's love. Yeah. And if they had that opportunity. Um, and it was interesting that Mandy in her character, um, how she said, and I think AJ said to her, well, you know, how, how did you come along? Or She says, well, I saw all these people walking to this place and I thought, well, well I should go and check this out. <laughs> <laughs> and in, you yeah. know, in her checking that out, she brought a thousand spirits with her yeah. that were able to be assisted. Yeah. Um, and so that was beautiful. Yeah. Um, but it did make me reflect on that, our fear... We have beliefs based on our fear that... Shut everyone out. Shut it down yeah. totally. Yeah. And then with Karen, um, what struck me about her was the, you know, the charitability of her, their life. Mm -hmm. And that was probably why one of your questions were to us about charitability. And then... Um, and she couldn't understand um, our, our judgments and our... Um, um, fears and our um, um, emotions um, mm -hmm. towards religion and those things and mm -hmm. I had to really reflect on that um, and yeah. I think, I think um, yeah, it's, it's like <laughs> we're so selective still and this is something that I have to look at myself mm. um, and, um, and nobody um, qualifies for our um, judgments in any way, shape or form. And, and if I'm still doing that, yeah, I, yeah. I feel very um, sad that I'm still one of those people. Yeah, I feel like it's good that you bring it up, Barbara, because a lot of us like talking about Mandy, but Karen actually came and delivered a pretty big message yep. to our group, didn't yep. she, about how closed we are to people who do not share our beliefs. And, you know... As I think she expressed, I can't remember all of the channeling, but she was expressing that she'd lived a life in service and, and she felt some level of hypocrisy coming from us about how um, we kind of had it all figured out and yet she's saying, hang on, something doesn't add up here. It doesn't, I can see that there's some truth in what's being said, but I'm not necessarily seeing it reflected in the people who were sitting in the audience. And come to think of it, I feel quite judged right now. And, and I can't even get my question answered because I want to grow. So I feel that was, that's it. just, you know, the law of attraction is always so perfect. And, you know, for myself and my hope for you guys is that we can reflect on the, the messages that she was able to give us about well, how is this really looking in my life and what, what attitudes do I really still have towards other people around judgment and around Christianity because that seemed to be a pretty big um, message that she had, Lorleen. Yeah, I was really taken by that message from um, Karen because what um, pivoted her thought was um, uh, when it was actually reflected back to her that did she know that she was judging as well. And if I look at, at this thing about judgment... Um, she was feeling judged by us for having a belief. Um, and we, we judge others saying, oh, they had this and it's orthodox and all the rest. But our actions actually are doing exactly the same thing. Do you know? Like it, we become yes. an orthodox sect by Definitely. having the same attitude. Definitely. And it was actually, um, it was in a an accidental channeling um, when I was addressing something with uh, uh, mm -hmm. child Yourself, abuse. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, um, and the, the person who was attached to me, I, I was really quite afraid. And it goes back to this thing about I don't want to know because it makes me scared. Mm -hmm. But I actually did talk to her and it happened to be that she said all these things. And um, it made me feel like... Oh, through the through the interaction, and once I allowed and said, uh, drop their judgment because I was recalling that message. 
um, I could actually come into a rapport with her and through the rapport discover that, um, that her being able to tell me so much about herself, which I thought was terrible because she's attached and she's attacking, mm -hmm. But she gave me so much insight into my own um, addictions as to why I actually called her in to me. Yeah. Because that's why the spirits are around me. Yeah. And if I allow that, I can actually see what the hooks that I have that are just mirroring what they're attracted to. Definitely. And there's so much in that. Definitely. Know? And yeah. the truth is when we're really humble, we'll... We'll want truth from any avenue. <laughs> we'll see it from every avenue. We'll receive it from every avenue. And and this this is, you know, what we were stressing last week about how when we shut down mediumship, we shut down our possibility for growth a lot, just through like experiences like you're saying, not by seeking it out or doing it for other people, but just by being conscious of who's around me. There's so much I can learn about myself. And then, as we saw in the case of both Mandy and Karen, if I can respond, remember the sympathetic attraction gives me the opportunity to respond in love. If I respond in love, we both grow. So it's a gift on a lot of levels. Yeah, yeah and I, I'd just been feeling, because I had found out so much about this abuse just on this weekend, um, I was feeling really angry and going, you know, all this information. And, but when I finished talking with her, it was like, isn't this great? I mean, that feeling that I didn't quite believe when you said, isn't it great, we find yes. out. I'm going, no, it's not. <laughs> and, and it was. It was really a, it was a, it was a strange relief to find out more about yourself, even though it wasn't nice. God, uh, yes. Does, yes. Does anyone else feel that? It's so relieving to find out truth. Um, I, I really feel that often. Like it hurts sometimes. And you go, oh, but if you can, this is where, and this is probably the last point that I wanted to talk to you guys about today, where if you can stay out of self judgment and self punishment, it is relieving because you know you can change from that point. It's where we get stuck in the pothole of self-punishment, judgment, shame, blame, all that kind of really harsh stuff you put on yourself, then, then immediately the possibility for growth isn't there. But I'd say if you felt relief when you felt the truth, you were, yeah, yeah, you were avoiding that stuff. So that's good. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, who have we heard from today who's got the hand up? No. We'll go Yvonne and go, if you pass back to Jen here, yeah. Um, Mary, I found the channelings very inspiring in terms of, yes, I'd like to Im improve my mediumship because I know that I can do it and it just requires practice and desire. But, but more than that, it, I found it very inspiring for me personally in terms of how I show up in the world, whether that's with people on the earth or in the spirit world. And like I said before about... <coughs> sorry. ..about learning to love um, without respecting individually and and that requires something that was discussed in one of the earlier chapters about having a desire to hear people's story and seek to understand where mm -hmm. they're coming from mm -hmm. so um, uh, the channelings were really valuable we got a lot out of them Thank yeah you. that's good mm. jen oh uh, both jens <laughs> yeah. um you had on the board another word shame yes when um we first started. Yep. But you've since rubbed it off. And yep. And I wanted to ask you about shame and how a person, how I might access my shame for things that I've done. Mm -hmm. How, the question is, how do you start to access shame? Oh, good question. It's topical for me. Um... I'm just getting to know shame as an emotion. <laughs> um, but something, some things that I feel that I'm beginning to learn about it is when yucky stuff has happened to us as a child, we often take on this belief that I am bad and yuck. And that's like shame. And that's a feeling that I have to experience and release, the yucky feeling. But I'm never going to do it while I hold on to the belief 
that I am bad and I am to blame. It's like one anchors the other inside of me and they kind of entered me at the same time. Do you know, um, so there's, oh, I'm still getting used to the board thing. There's like, I am bad and then the icky feeling of like, um, yeah, it's, I'm not good with the language of it yet, Jen, but hopefully you'll get my heart on it. The, the icky, yucky, ugh, shame feeling is often like anchored together with, I deserve this, I want this, I'm bad, it's all, you know, it's because I'm bad this is happening. Now this, this one, this is happening because of me and because of something inherently in me, is an error belief. And often I use that to, I use it circularly, like I attack myself, I have the icky feeling, oh yeah, you've got that because you wanted it and, you know, it turns into this big cyclical thing. What I'm finding is I have to start to challenge that I am bad and go, no, no, God only makes beautiful things. I'm not bad inherently. Something yucky happened to me. And as a result, I have this icky feeling. I'm going to have to feel the icky feeling, but I'm never going to successfully release it while I hold on to the self-blame around it. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Also, when oh, I've spent a lot of time running away from that icky feeling yep. and gone into other icky places yes. and perpetuated ickiness onto other people, for want of a better way of putting it. Yes. Like, yes. Bad, wicked places where yeah, I think running I know away what... from that feeling. Yeah. My question is, is repentance the way yep. to go towards the cause or do you ask for God's help to go towards the cause and then come back towards all of this the is... things that you've done to run away from that? Yep. Can I stop you? Because I know exactly what you're saying. The issue is that first thing that happened where I took on the belief I am bad and ooh, icky, that thing is something I need to, I need to forgive the people who did that to me. I can't repent. Most of us who've had yucky things happen to us in our childhood, I feel try to repent for that. And you can't repent for that. You have to, in the end, grieve that it happened to you and forgive the person who did it to you. Now, when we've had that ickiness enter us and that I'm bad, and then we go off and do some other icky things, which most of us who've been sexually harmed do end up doing, we do either perpetrate more ickiness to ourselves or associate with other people and make big icky scenarios, then there's repentance. In We need to repent for those things. And we can go back towards the cause by starting this process of repentance. But the magic thing is not holding on to this self-punishing belief that I am inherently bad. And this is why I had it on the board today because I feel like a lot of you guys when we start to talk about errors this feeling comes up in you is like oh I can't hear all about this I, it's just going to mean that I am bad I was made bad and this is just more evidence stacking on to the fact that I'm a bad person the truth is you're not and we can talk about error and injury from a place of compassion with ourselves and with each other and when AJ and I point out different errors inside of each of you guys, that's the space we're doing it from. It's not to add evidence to the fact that you're a bad person. But I see a lot of people receive it like that. And when that happens, yucky things happen inside of you. You then start feeling attacked or defending and then you start doing it with each other. Oh, that person's spirit influence. Oh, that person's got that. And it's, it's finger pointing and blaming and it just... And it adds to this kind of cycle that you've already been raised in where there's a lot of blaming and shaming going on. So that's why I had it on the board because I wanted to talk to everyone about this idea, this, you're holding on to these beliefs about you're bad and it's slowing everything down. Um, if you can start to pray about this idea that, no, I was created beautiful, some bad stuff happened and I'm going to have to forgive ultimately for those things that happened. Beyond that, I, I, well, uh, to begin that, I have to start repenting for the things I've done as a result of that. It's kind of a 
dance that I'm doing. But while I'm punishing and holding on to I'm bad, it's never going to... I'm never going to pull off either thing, forgiveness or repentance. So you brought up forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And is that a choice, a free will choice that you go towards? Or do... Now I feel like... I'm trying to understand it in my head. Yes. When I know that forgiveness is not in my heart yet. And Jen, I don't want to get into... So I should engage... (laughs) No, no. Um, I feel like there's a lot of good material that AJ's already presented on forgiveness. But it's true, you can't just intellectually forgive. You're going to have to commit to feeling the pain of what was done to you, which starts back with this giving up that I am inherently bad and feeling the yucky feelings. As you do that, you'll get towards forgiveness. Yeah. Okay. Other Jen? Yeah. Um. I was one of the people who, the day that we were talking about the Christians, I felt this judgment that I spoke. And it's mm-hmm. like, as soon as I did it, thank goodness, I was self-aware enough to go, ooh, I was just judging. But the fact that you did this channeling and went into it even more, it's like, it was such a gift. And I really can see where I had been judging about their their arrogance. Yeah. And... What I realized today is that I have so much pain inside of me of, of what has happened to me as a result of other people being arrogant towards me. Um, and I just have to go through that feeling because I don't want to be one of those people that's yeah. judging others. I don't want to be arrogant like that because it causes so much pain. Yeah. I just have to go through it. Yeah, and you've, you've seen the point that unless I go through it, I'm just going to become it. Yeah, 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 awesome. Okay, guys, I think we need to, I think it's time to finish anyway. Um, I feel like hopefully we've rounded out the chapter. Woo-hoo. It's over. Uh, and um, thanks for coming on the journey. I feel like there's still some stuff going on with us, hey, that we're going to iron out as the weeks progress about um, how much I still want to please you and you still want to have some addictions met in this group. So I'm just going to be a lot, like, quite conscious of that and keeping that in my own prayers for growth as well because I do really want this to be a space where we can all grow and stretch and... um, and just be really real. And as soon as we get into addiction, have you noticed it doesn't feel really real? It doesn't feel that good. Sometimes when we're really real, it feels challenging, but it also feels more connected, doesn't it? Um, so that's where I'm going to be headed. And uh, hopefully chapter 13 will be just as enchanting as, uh, <laughs> as the, the previous 12. <laughs> okay, guys. AJ's going to give a talk soon, so hang around if you want. Can I just say, it is my joy to do this with all of you guys. So I really value your um, participation. And just because I talk about addiction doesn't mean I feel like it's going badly. I just want it to, you know, I want us to shoot for the stars. Yeah, lovely. If you just pass the mic, yeah. I just wanted to suggest uh, the movie The Others. Uh, some people have seen it, but yep. it's really a good uh, movie to see what it's like on the other side of what we yep. perceive. Yeah, uh, I just thought. Just as yeah, a it's a, it's a good movie. I agree. The Others, and I can't think of any others off the top of my head. The Sixth Sense is a pretty good movie. I feel for the medium, but and also to show what happens for people, how they can get lost. But yeah. Because she's so confused about where she is and yeah. we keep thinking that we're yeah. the side. It's just a nice to see the other side. You yeah, know? yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. See you later, guys.